Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Welcome to A Moment with Aisha Bain. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. You uh, are an activist. You work at Global Rights. What is that? It's a non-governmental organization, an NGO, and we work in human rights issues around the world, building local capacities of NGOs. I said you're an activist. In fact, you are a woman who took an astonishing chance going into one of the most dangerous regions on Earth to tell us the story of one of the greatest tragedies on earth, that of the genocide in Darfur, the Sudan. Before we talk, Aisha, let's take a look. Darfur Diaries Message from Home is a powerful documentary about the human tragedy occurring in the Darfur region of Sudan. Since it began in 2003, at least 200,000 people have died. Another two million are now refugees. In 2004, Aisha Bain, Adam Shapiro, and Jen Marlowe, three young human rights activists, embarked on a dangerous journey into the region to tell the story of the conflict in northern Africa. There was no voice of any Darfurians in the media speaking on behalf of themselves and their own people about what was happening. We wanted to go talk to village elders, community leaders, uh, religious leaders, women, children, anyone we could talk to, to really find out what, what their thoughts were about what was happening and what their thoughts of the future were. Interviews, especially with the children, tell the story. We decided to focus on children. Uh, that are the most marginalized and it's just, just about every conflict and of, of, often get ignored in, in peace processes. <laughs> The filmmakers visited refugee camps in Chad and then slipped across the border into Darfur, going behind rebel lines where there's been a news blackout imposed by the Sudanese government. There were a couple times where uh, you see in the film some planes flew overhead. The people were horrified and, and mortified and that really showed us what they were going through on a daily basis because we really didn't understand why they were not living in closer to water sources, why they were not living closer to their village. They interviewed refugees living in some of the harshest conditions. <laughs> Despite living conditions, they found an inspiring spirit and strength among the Darfurians. There are still weddings, and they are committed to the future and educating their children. This is the beginning of the school. The women's and men's and young girls have built two schools. And now we have uh, 315 people. The documentary also takes you to a training camp to meet fighters resisting the Sudanese government. 
لا خليته هجار بدون عمل لنا هجار وجيه هنا إيه في الثورة لا أحد يحرق قرانا لا أحد يختصب أخواتنا لا أحد يختصبنا بدون حد نعمل مهما كان أنا يفعلنا سوريني the situation in Darfur has largely been attributed to tribal warfare between Africans and Arabs. But the people in the documentary have a different take on the conflict. Everyone knew the absolute truth of what was happening, what was going on, that it was the government, their government that was manipulating the situation to really uh, try and create this ethnic divide. The government used Arab like gun, like his gun, to, to kill us. السؤال في الدول العربية برضه هل هنا أخواتهم تتكلموا باللسان العربية عندنا المشاكل لا نراها قبل كده أبدا ما لقينا قبل كده أبدا في حياتنا هم برضه يحسوا بمشكلتنا ده ويقيفوا معنا وقفة قوية عشان يحلوا لنا مشكلتنا to just hand a microphone to somebody and to watch their entire uh, character their entire presence change to watch them be completely empowered to to say, we're going to tell your story to the world here, tell your story, and to watch them just share what they were going through, the sophisticated stories of the conflict uh, of their own lives. Aisha hopes Darfur Diaries will not only educate Americans about the conflict, but also motivate them to take action. You see, Kim Skeen reporting for A Moment With. Let's first place this conflict for the audience. Geographically, it is in the west of Sudan in an area about the size of Texas or France, known as Darfur region. Aisha, tell me what life was like there before the conflict. Absolutely, and that's part of the reason we wanted to do the film. Um, picture Darfur, and you can kind of take it a north and south. Uh, the north is traditionally uh, where herders live. It's very much desert-like, um, and then as you go south into Darfur and you drop a little bit, there's a little more agriculture and there's a little more um, a suitable land to grow uh, crops. So the two tribes, oh, there are many tribes in Darfur. Darfur actually means land of the fur tribe, but there are many tribes, and the tribes would all come together to meet, and that's how they sustained life for many years. And there were also Arabic tribes that would come in and out of the region with their livestock, livestock competing for resources. Uh, however, but, over th but peacefully competing? Well, wherever you have men, you will have conflict. But uh, the conflicts were nothing like we've seen today. Uh, whenever something arose, the tribal chiefs would get together and they would decide how many herds of cattle or, or how many heads of cattle or, or camel would solve the conflict and then they would go about uh, their, their lives. And that would actually tra traditionally solve their conflicts. They had their own traditional means. Um, and nothing um, compared to, to the scale of today. Okay, nothing compared to the scale of today, which begs the question that everyone asks, why? Why the genocide? The basics of the story is you're looking at the central periphery conflict. You're looking at the government of Sudan. In Khartoum, this government came to power by military coup. Therefore, they do not enjoy widespread conflict, around, uh, widespread support, rather, around the rest of the country. And they have... Uh, intentionally marginalized and not developed the rest, the, the rest of the, the, their population of these peoples. And that's why you saw this long conflict in the south, between the north and the south. You've seen it in the east, you've seen it in the Nuba Mountains, you've seen it in many regions of Sudan. And now in Darfur again, they are fighting for their rights. They are fighting because they have no roads, no, shell, um, no hospitals, no schools. They have little next to nothing, and they've been continually suppressed and oppressed and attacked and uh, they've been suffering from, from this oppressive Islamic regime and they're fighting for their rights now. The extent of the horror of the Islamic regime called Janjaweed. Yes. Janjaweed, am I saying that properly? Yes. I read about a little girl, two years old, a toddler, na toddler named Sarah Bishara, knifed in the back by government troops. So many of the stories are beyond comprehension. Why why go that far with it? When you can, you can understand, at some level I can understand wars between men. Right. I don't understand when the slaughter of children. When the Darfurians began fighting for their rights, the Sudanese government wanted to send a clear message to the rest of the country. They had been fighting, they'd fought in the south for decades and they'd lost. They'd had to, uh, the international uh, community finally broke a peace deal and they 
lost. Um, they've, they've been fighting conflicts all over the country and now in Darfur, and they said absolutely that it's enough. And they want the rest of the country to realize that if you rise up against us, you will also go through this pain. And so you're, the things in Darfur are unspeakable and are for, not for the weak of heart. You're talking about rapes, uh, abduction for sexual slavery, uh, girls seven or younger. You're talking in front of their men and in front of their families. Uh, you're talking about impaling babies, burning people alive, partially skinning people, tying people up in the desert or dragging them by the noose around their neck by camel and horse through the desert. I can go on. You're talking about the most horrible atrocities uh, that one man can inflict against another. And it is a clear message to the rest of the country, if you rise up against this extreme Islamic government uh, that does not enjoy power from the rest of the country, that is trying to contain all the power and all the wealth, if you challenge that, this is what will happen to you. There are conflicting numbers about the number of dead. Um, yes. We read 200,000, uh, we read 400,000. Do we really know? The absolute truth I will share with you, we don't know. Mm -hmm. And this came up uh, years ago when we, were f when we were first deciding what was really happening in this conflict, and numbers came out for a long time, it was only 70,000. And they were saying that was only from starvation and not from the numbers killed. And then they realized their estimates were too small. Um, this is largely in part because the Sunni's government has impeded international efforts to travel around the country. That's journalism, that's journalists, that's uh, humanitarian aid workers do not have full access to the entire region, therefore to help people or to really see what's happening. And that's further uh, been a, a problem as of late that the government has further tightened their leashes on these different aid workers and journalists to get around and see what's happening as of late. So the truth is we don't really know. As of May, no, March 2005, Jan Eglin of the UN said an estimated 10,000 people were dying a month, not from the violence. And as of, I believe, this fall, another UN official said that it's estimated if the violence continues and the situation continues to deteriorate, an estimated 100,000 people might die a month. I, no one really knows what the death toll is at this point. And in fact, it's called the world's largest political and humanitarian crisis. And Correct. yet, it does receive so little attention from the world's news media. Or am I wrong? Is there is there anybody anywhere that's covering this story. Certainly our human rights groups here in the U.S. have been phenomenal in trying to push this out, but it doesn't mean the media outlets pick it up, which means unless the, rest of the, unless the rest of the world and the U.S. population goes to these specific websites, they may not get the information. And it's been a kind of like a popular rising and falling in the U.S. media. If our officials go over there, if Condoleezza Rice goes over there. And she did, we should yes. say. She did go, but only as far as neighboring Chad. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, one of uh, a U.N. official was just kicked out of Chad not too long ago by the Sudanese government. Uh, and I should say BBC has been quite incredible in reporting this. They have an ongoing website that's updated quite often. Uh, and most U.S. citizens do not check foreign media sites. Uh, some mm -hmm. European papers have been covering this and mm -hmm. on and off out of other media sources. Mm -hmm. When I was in Thailand, I saw a two-page full article on, on this conflict. But it's been a, kind of a popular uh, in and out uh, mm -hmm. seasonal type of thing. And of course, there's so many other U.S. interests that are around the world in terms of Iraq and Afghanistan, which mm -hmm. will easily overshadow a conflict in Africa. And, uh, BBC, um, have they covered it broadcast as well as on the internet. Yes, they have. Yeah, yeah they're, um, they're excellent for that. And I say that we have the BBC here. And yet our... they use the, the conservative numbers of only 200,000 killed, which I find actually really interesting. Um, but it's, I mean, it's hard to get yeah. Yeah. information. It's hard to get the facts. Um, you brought up the UN. What has the UN done? Um, at the start of this conflict, the UN was really quiet. Um, unfortunately so, amazingly so. 2004 marked the 10, 10th year anniversary of the Rwandan genocide. When we said never again, when the world said never again, when we said we'd pay attention, when we would react. And then here it was a clear conflict. Whether the UN didn't call it genocide, the US called it genocide, and this was the most amazing part. If it's terrible enough to be called or to be considered being called genocide, obviously it's bad enough and we should be doing something about it. And yet we stood silent and we celebrated and we commemorated, we, we, we more memorialized the Rwandan genocide and yet another one was happening and we weren't doing anything about it. That was 2004. It's fast approaching 2007. The UN as of late has been much more active. They helped broker a peace agreement in May 
And uh, now they've been trying to push for a UN peacekeeping force to enter uh, Sudan. The problem is, is that the Sudanese government has to agree to let the force in, which, of course, why would the criminals allow yeah. a peacekeeping force to stop their own actions? Exactly. What strikes me particularly about um, your film and the clip we saw was the will of the people to go on uh, at all, uh, much less continue to try to educate their children. What drives them, do you think? Well, I'm not Darfurian, so I, I hesitate to speak for them, but I will speak for what I saw. And it was remarkable, the, the human strength to survive, the human courage and, and, and dignity which with they overcame and, and their perseverance. It, they were, their spirit was like water, and the more the Sudanese government tried to, to hold it and, and, and clench it, the more that it escaped them. Uh, they were remarkable. We managed to celebrate a wedding and to, mm. and to laugh with them, as well as cry with them and, and experience, or at least hear about their suffering and their grief. There's not a single person in Darfur who has not been affected by this conflict. You're talking about over 400,000 dead, uh, Roughly 3.5 million people now completely dependent on, on humanitarian aid. Mm -hmm. That 2,000, over 2 million people displaced, so to over 200,000 refugees in, in Chad, and now the, it's also spilled into the Central African Republic. You're talking about massive numbers of people, and we don't know all the numbers. And it's changing every day. Absolutely. We have a clip. It's a husband in Darfur sending a message to his family. Yes. Set that up before we roll the tape. Some things we didn't know we'd be able to do when we set out to do this film. And when we were in Darfur, we actually met a fighter, and he started talking to us about his family and how he hadn't seen them since the conflict started. And he sent them to Chad to try and escape and be safe. And he didn't know where they were. He'd heard they were in one refugee camp, and he knew nothing about them. Mm -hmm. And obviously, they hadn't heard from him. Mm -hmm. So we said, well, we're on our way out. We will try to go to this camp and see if we can find her and your family. And he was just welled with pride and with joy. Mm -hmm. And in a camp, of 24,000 people, we found his family in six minutes. Oh, that, that's amazing. Let's, let's take a look at the tape. Tell him we will try to go to this camp. And does he have a message for his wife and his kid? I got an idea of Quiggy. Quiggy got a lay, got an eye, but I got a say he lived the Talga, high out of the Talga. He knew you. I do, and La Elirdo, Beratale, La Elirdo, and he killed Kierdo. Okay, I would regret a car, Yan, Ali, I live to sell him in the Ido. Toda. Say hi to my dad. That gives me... Oh, my. Um, and that family fled to Chad. Correct. Yes. Um, what do we know of life for the displaced in the refugee camps? Sure. There's two situations. There are the refugees... Uh, that are in Chad and in the Central African Republic and that those are, that are still displaced in Darfur. For the refugees, um, they are lucky in the fact that they are considerably out of the fighting. There has still been fighting happening and attacks happening across the border in some of the camps. And there's, I mean, it's been remarkable. Um, but for the refugees themselves, they have access to food, to water, to shelter. Yet, these organizations, uh, the UNHCR, UNICEF, the World Food Program, has, has had to slash their budgets. So yet, they've had problems meeting the actual food rations uh, on time. There's been problems with, with um, some security in the camps. And for these refugees, and this came across with every refugee we met, that they could not fathom being in that camp a month longer 
never mind a year longer. We asked them what they would do and how they would survive in Chad for, for the future. They said, what future? We will go home. Um, and this had, we've seen refugee situations across, across the world that these are never very short term, unfortunately. Um, and then you really break down a society when you, they're dependent and there's nothing that they can do and then this becomes their way of life. In Darfur, it's a totally different story for the displaced. Um, it's total hell, to be honest. They are in camps. There are 14,000 aid workers in Darfur. But you're talking about over 2 million, 3 million displaced. Um, so we're not talking about a large number then. These aid workers cannot get around uh, well enough there by the Sudanese government and by the infrastructure themselves. Therefore, these people are not all receiving aid. Uh, the camps themselves are constantly subject to attack by these John Jaweed militias and the government forces, which has been happening on a daily basis. Uh, at right now, and now as we speak, I get a, a reports all the time of the attacks in the camps themselves, as well as people who are, who are just displaced, just interspersed about the countryside. Um, and you're talking about people who are having a really hard time getting food, water, and one of the worst things that's happening for medicine. women Medicine, medicine, of I, course. I was at the um, refugee camps at Saw Cow um, yes. uh, after Pol Pot, um, the border of Cambodia, and the disease, the sickness, sickness was, was rampant. Absolutely. There have been cholera breakouts, uh, meningitis. They've been, they've been trying to keep uh, tabs on really what's happening all over the place, but you have that type of, that many people in one place uh, without proper sanitation, all different types of conditions, it's, it's bound to break out into disease. So, so, Aisha, to talk about the resistance or a resistance, it almost seems futile what they're fighting. What chance does the resistance have? We should say the name of the resistance is the Sudanese Liberation Army. Correct. SLA. Yes. The SLA, which are featured in the film, is also a gem, the Justice and Equality Movement, uh, but they've been a, a smaller role, played a smaller role as of late. Um, their chance, they're obviously up against uh, the... the, the the balances are, are nowhere near close. I mean, it's, it's really the, the Sudanese government and the billions of dollars they get a year from oil and everything else. I mean, there's no, there's no chance, there's no equitable equation here. Um, By way of numbers. Um, numbers, or artillery. Weapons, uh, they, yes. They don't have an air force. They don't have a cavalry. They don't have the numbers. Uh, there's no way. Uh, they don't have the technology, the same technology that the Sudanese government has and has been implementing in this conflict. Uh, yet the, the SLA uh, has been able to maintain uh, a steady force to, rec to have the international community recognize them and recognize what they're fighting for. They're fighting for their country and their people. They are tired of being persecuted. They are tired of being indiscriminately attacked by the Sudanese government, uh, which they say, and they say this in the film, has gone back years before we recognized the conflict being started in February 2003. Uh, they want roads. They want schools. They want political representation in their own government so that they have an, a say in their own life and their own human rights. They want security. Uh, they want so many other things that don't exist currently, which the Sudanese government purposely has not uh, implemented in these parts of the country. And Darfur is just one example. It's happening all over the country. Earlier this year, in the spring, was there not some sort of peace agreement signed yes. between the, the two sides? Was that just nonsense? Yes. Mm -hmm. There was a peace agreement signed in May 2006 of this year, brokered by the UN, the US, many governments played a role, and they really hurriedly, they wanted something, and they thought that if you throw a patch over this, that it would hopefully go away on its own. They did not involve all the major stakeholders. Only one of the three uh, rebel groups signed onto it. What the US government, what many people did, and said, okay, well, this, this rebel group wants peace, the rest of them don't, so we'll discard them. Yet this peace agreement did not equitably uh, really provide proper political representation for their government, did not uh, act equitably uh, go into implementation of security and how the people would be secure, or enough detail on actual victim compensation. I mean, you're talking about now the, all these people, their villages have been burned, their crops have been burned, their cattle, their cattle and animals have been killed or stolen. Many of their family members have died. They will have nothing when they go back, and what are they to do? So it didn't go into proper detail of victim comp compensation, nor did it even address, well, the implementation of one of the most important things, which is the disarming of the Janjui, these militias. These militias that have been terrorizing these people for years now, it didn't talk about how this would be implemented. Would the AU forces oversee this? Would a, would a UN peacekeeping force oversee this? And what, who would keep security? And it di they didn't go into these details. And these different rebel groups felt what we've been fighting for, we can't sign this. And the U.S. government, as well as the U.N., have 
assisted this rebel leader who, sounded, who signed it, uh, Mini Manawi, to be the presidential advisor in, in uh, Sudan to uh, Omar Bashir. Yet he, if, we, if the ICC actually gets to prosecute war criminals, he should be among them. He's one of the worst rebel leaders that are out there and one of the, has one of the worst reputations. We watched Rwanda um, and only belatedly uh, understood the horror of it. We are watching this and certainly much of the industrialized world does not yet realize the horror of it. Why do these things go on, in your opinion, and something like similar in Kosovo, there's in intercession? Um, well, if we That's a the, loaded question, I know. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, let me take a minute. Um, if, we, if we look at just the examples you've provided, Rwanda's in Africa, Darfur's in Africa, Kosovo's in Eastern Europe. That might seek volumes within itself on its own. And people are free to infer what they want from that, but certainly there are different policies, and some of them may be racially or influenced. But uh, we, have a much less toler we have much less tolerance or, or patience for, for conflicts in Africa. And certainly mm -hmm. um, the, the means by which we, we address issues in Africa mm -hmm. uh, in our history has, has shown this as well. If the world were to suddenly wake up tomorrow, particularly the West, and do something, what should it be? Well, inarguably, inarguably security is a problem in Darfur, and it must, that ha the actual conflict has to be stopped for these people to, to stop dying. Um, but it should also be true that our political and diplomatic efforts have not been exhausted. If anything, the, the opposite, the U.S. government um, has really, and the, the West as a whole, has said that they would, we would uh, Im impose sanctions on the government. Yet, as of late, the U.S. government said that they would start doing this in 2000, early 2005. As of late, they've only imposed sanctions against one top official in the Sunnese government who's retired. Well, what that, kind of message does that send? Right. When we host their, right. t their right. chief of security, what right. type of message does that, does that send? send? We have tad less than a minute. What sure. can individuals do? Um, they can inform themselves, inform other people, visit our website to find out more information about the different things they can do. And your website is? www.darfordiaries.org. Thank you. Thank you. For being here. I want you to come back and talk about the making of the film. Will I you would do that? love to. Thank I would love you. to. Activist and filmmaker Aisha Bain. Thanks for being with us for this moment with Aisha. And we will see you back here again. I'm Lee Thornton.